This is a man of magnificent, who made that dawn with gold and color, and with good of blue tiles, and with the calligraphy of the Quran verse, as in Surah Yasin, is very visible from that. So the history then comes back to you, but you also realize that that dawn is not, it wasn't built by the Ottomans, it goes far, far back up to 72 after Hijri, or 693, when Abdul Malik al Marwan commissioned it. And it is the most magnificent architectural structure in the world. All the dawns that came after that were copied from that, as to how to create a dawn to stand in that magnificent way. So it has a great testament. But as soon as we reached uh, Escalanda as the dome of the rock, on the right hand side is you notice there's a dome of Yusuf that connects to Yusuf al Islam. Because Yusuf was born in and around Masjid al Aqsa. It is from Masjid al Aqsa and the surrounding area that he was taken away from there to Egypt. And very next to Egypt, to Yusuf's dome is on my right hand side, the dome of Musa al Islam. It's a very small dome with a black covering. Uh, you can't access it. Four sides are covered. Sorry, six sides are covered. But then you also remind yourself that Musa al Islam is the one who brought the Bani Israel from the descendants of Yusuf al Islam back into Jerusalem. But Musa al Islam could not enter Jerusalem uh, because his time had come to pass away and Allah had wanted to take his life. But the amazing thing was the love of Musa al Islam for Jerusalem was so much that when Allah sent the angels of death to Musa al Islam, he first slaps him. And it's amazing. Musa al Islam slaps him and says, the Time is not right. The angel goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, you know, you send me to your servant, your prophet, but he doesn't want to come to you. What shall I do? Allah says to the angels, go back to him and tell him, put your hand over an ox, and whatever the number of hairs you have under that hand is the number of years you will live. And then Musa asks the angel, what will happen after that? He says, death. Then Musa says, I want, I'd rather see my creator now. But, and this is the amazing thing, a prophet of Allah, great prophet who is mentioned most in the Holy Quran, says, please take my life near Masjid al-Aqsa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills his promise. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says that if you take me, I will show you the grave of Musa al-Islam, which is a stone throw away from Masjid al-Aqsa. Next to Yusuf al-Islam, because of course you now want to enter the, the Golden Dome, and you go inside and you see, you, you take, you've been taken downstairs from the rock itself, and there's a big niche, a big cave, and people say that is the cave of Daoud. Allah knows best. And this is where Daoud al Islam prayed his Zabur. And when he prayed, not only did the bird sing with him, but the very sound of Jerusalem, the mountains, resonated his voice. And that just takes place in around Jerusalem. So you can see the connections with many prophets. And then you think of his son Suleiman al Islam in his dome. He says, You come out on the left hand side, further down to the north entrance gate. And Suleiman al Islam is the one who completes the building of Masjid al Aqsa. But Suleiman al Islam is not the one who builds the masjid, he completes the building. Because the original building of Masjid al Aqsa was built 40 years after the Kaaba by Adam al Islam. So the Muslims' inheritance and heritage of Masjid al Aqsa goes back to the creation of man himself. And then you want to come out of the Dome of the Rock, and as soon as you face what you see is the Masjid al Kibli, the Black Dome Masjid. And you want to enter the Black Dome Masjid, and there you see a history of Islam and resonance itself. Because as soon as you enter, you see the most magnificent member in the world, made of 630 pieces, but not a single piece of nail or a screw has been used or glue to put that member together. It's glueless, screwless, right? But it is an amazing piece. It was commissioned by Nuruddin Zingi, by Nuruddin Zingi, and placed in Masjid by Salaudin Naibi Rahmatullah. Unfortunately, the original member was burned down in 1959 by a Zionist arsonist and then it was recreated again, it was just been replaced recently. So when you look on the left hand side and you realize as well that the masjid itself was originally commissioned by the son of Abu Malik al Barwan. But then it was originally built, its foundation was originally made by Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. So you can see the history and heritage. When you come out on the left hand side is the cradle of Isa al-Islam. And when you read all the stories of Maryam al-Islam, that she was attached to a niche, that niche was in Masjid al-Aqsa. So you see the connection with Christianity as well. So the Rebbe al-Islam's bad tidings takes place in Masjid al-Aqsa. When Zakaria al-Islam enters the Mihrab in the Holy Quran, it says that when he enters the Mihrab, he sees wonderful foods out of season. And she, she, he asks Maryam, where are you getting all these foods from, Maryam? Maryam says, this comes from Allah. And Zakaria says, he realizes he himself is a prophet. So Zakaria realizes he's blessed, he's blessed. 
This is a place of miracles. So there and then, the Quran says, there at that very spot, this performs two rakah salam, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he blesses him with a child. He is some say at the age of 90. So is his wife. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before he ends his salah, sends an angel saying, your dua is accepted. Not only is your dua accepted, but this is the first child on earth where Allah gives the name to that child, Yahya al -Islam. That takes place in Masjid al-Aqsa. And then, of course, we look back, and one of the greatest symbols you see is the Qubba al-Mahraj. The Qubba al-Mahraj that connects Masjid al-Aqsa, some say, from earth to heavens. And you realize the connection between Mecca, the first Masjid that we built, 40 years later, Masjid al-Aqsa, and the trans transportation of the Prophet وسلم, from Haram of Makkah to Masjid al-Aqsa. And then you realize that the very feet, uh, the machines are touching on the ground. It's possible that on that night, when the Prophets, 124,000 of them, prostrated, you could be standing on that spot. That is what connects you to Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is how all the three faiths are connected to Jerusalem. Jazakallah khair. That was exactly 10 minutes. Um, so, next question to Dr. Dawood Abdullah. Are Palestinians indigenous to the land? How and why? Do you have 10 minutes? Palestinians indigenous to the land? Yes, they are. How and why? Well, let me start with the Palestine itself as a geographic uh, location. Uh, this land is situated at the heart of the Fertile Crescent, uh, which is that arc of territory land stretching all the way from the Euphrates in Iraq to the Nile. Sudan and Egypt. It is at the crossroad of three continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia. So uh, its very location uh, has been a, a reason for, for it to be contested, you see, and, and envied and targeted by many people's civilizations over the years. Ever since the dawn of history, or as far as histor historical records have been uh, uh, recorded, uh, Palestine has always been uh, 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 populated, inhabited. But the first known inhabitants of the land were the Canaanites. Who were they? They were Tribes, because the Canaanites, uh, within the Canaanites, there are sub tribes, sub groups. And they moved northeast out of the Arabian Peninsula around 3,500 years before uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And they settled in this land. Uh, harsh climatic conditions and famine in the Arabian Peninsula motivated and drove them to move uh, 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 to a, a more favorable you know, uh, 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 location. And so they settled in Palestine. Some of those uh, within the Canaanites, as I said, they were sub tribes. So you had the Amorites, you had the Phoenicians, for example. And the, the 
Canaan rights can earn himself uh, uh, according to Tobago uh, in his history uh, of the Brahmanic of the kingdoms. He said that a Canaan was the son of Lu. Uh, other sources said Canaan was the son of Ham, who was the son of Lu. But that is the lineage. And they ended up in Palestine, as I said, after moving out of uh, the Arabian Peninsula. So the Amorites occupied the, the hills above Janine, and the Yabusites, who was also a sub. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If, if you don't hear me, uh, please let me know. The Yabusites settled in Jerusalem, and the, the, Canaan, uh, the Canaanites on the coast. Now, uh, the Yabus, they built the city of Jerusalem. One of the, the, the kings called Melit Sonic, uh, he, 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 um, he built Jerusalem. So, as a result, the land came to be called the land of Canaan. Uh, and the ancient histories will refer to it as the land of Canaan because of the Second, the first known inhabitants of the land. But later on, about 2,000 years before uh, uh, Jesus and Salam, the Philistines came and they also settled uh, in the land on the southern coast uh, of, the, of, of, the, of, of what is Palestine. And this is the origin of the, of the, the word Philistine. They, were, they came from Crete. They were not Arabs. They were not Semitic people. So essentially, the, the, the people we call Palestinians today are descendants of, of the Canaanites who were Semitic and also of the Philistines who came from, from Crete. Uh, that is the, the origin of, 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 of the, the, uh, you know, the, the settlement in Palestine. Of course, when, they, when they, the Hebrews came, they came much later, about 1,500 years later, when they left Egypt, they found the land being occupied by these people called the Canaanites. And there were others who came and went from Persia, from the, Gre the, Greeks, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Egyptians. They all came and went. And so uh, our view is that uh, if want to speak about ownership of the land based on continuity of presence and based on privacy. Yeah, who was there first? It had to be the, the Canaanites. You see? So, so this is where we at in, in terms of, 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 of the origins of the land. And so when, 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 when the, the, the Jews and the Zans in particular make a claim which, is, which they say is historical, we refute it or on the basis that they were not, they, they came and they left as others came and left. They were transient. The, the, the Persians were transient, occupiers of the land. The Romans were transient, meaning they came and they were defeated. Uh, this is one of the significant things about, about, about the land here and the Canaanites in particular. See, from the time they entered the land, they always had a presence there. They never left. They were never driven out in its entirety or in their entirety. Of course, in 1948, 805,000 were driven out by the Zionist occupiers. But they, they always maintained their presence in Palestine. And, and, and uh, this is the significance, you see, uh, of, of their being there. As, as the original or indigenous people, as, as we are, as we are, are led to believe and as, as we have been taught. Uh, I want to stop here. Thanks. Uh, okay, you have one minute anyway, so it's not going to um, Okay, third question to Dr. Martini. Uh, what obstacles and barriers do Palestinians face today? Good question. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to split this into two categories. So you have Palestinians inside of Palestine and you have Palestinians outside of Palestine. Um, challenges that are facing 
uh, Palestinians in Palestine. First of all, you have 74 years of occupation. You have apartheid. You have uh, an open air prison in Gaza. Um, and all these things shape or, or form more challenges for people. Those who live in the West Bank and travel from the West Bank into the 1948 plans have to face hours of queues just to get to work and come back. Imagine someone was doing a checkpoint. Uh, I don't know, let's say, I, mean, I don't know Manchester that well, but let's say Manchester Piccadilly you're coming to or Oxford Road. Yeah? So let's say someone's giving you a checkpoint on Oxford Road and you have to stay there for five hours waiting for no reason, just for banter, right? Until you get through the checkpoint to get to work and then on the way back, the same thing. It's just a small example of an, inter an internal challenge that you face. Just being able to earn your living. Um, the challenge of being in Gaza, right? First of all, fishermen, they can't go beyond a certain number. I don't want to say the number because I don't know what it is. 12? 12 miles. 12 miles. Very, very short distance. For them to go and earn their living, they rely on that. They rely on what they fish to survive. And they can't go beyond that without the Navy, the Israeli Navy, coming down and shooting on very small dinghies and small uh, 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 boats made out of wood just for earning their living. Forget that. We're talking about the land, the land siege. Israel's not the only one applying the siege from from the Eretz side. We also and and the and the, and the you know the eastern side. We also have Egypt. Egypt is controlling the border the way it wants in a moody way. So they're under siege from every single side. And they're not allowed to have an airport. The first time that there was an opportunity for an airport, the Israelis went and bombed it. So again, it's an open air prison. The only thing they get is oxygen. So I guess we have to be thankful for that. And then you have. Um, Palestinians, or some people call them Israeli Arabs, who live in the 1948 land, right? They are subjected to apartheid of its own, or of its own form. The way they're treated like third-class citizens, um, the way they're denied opportunities in jobs. Some people say, oh, we've got Israeli Arabs, oh, they're part of the Israeli system. They're not treated equally. In the West Bank, I'll give you an anecdote, uh, not an anecdote, but like a, a story from one of our relatives, he's my mum's cousin. He lives in an area near Shahidat Street. So this is kind of where the epitome of apartheid, this, this is where the epitome of apartheid can be. This is literally apartheid central. This is a road that's split into two, where the wider area is for um, anyone that's not uh, Palestinian. The smaller area, the inaccessible area, where you can't even put a, ch a wheelchair in, you can't access it by car, you can only be there on foot, and you're restricted and you have to go through checkpoints, um, is left for the Palestinians. My cousin, he lives in an area, they call it the, uh, like the Jewish graveyard, because it's an area where there's a Jewish graveyard on the top. Um, there's a checkpoint, and the last time I visited, his diabetic daughters, who can barely carry themselves home, had to be carried by their father to get home. Imagine this here, imagine this in the United Kingdom, you get you know, some soldiers coming up to you saying, oh, your daughters aren't allowed to be let in by car, even though they're ill, even though they're... Uh, facing uh, uh, their trials and tribulations and, and the worst health conditions. Um, you know what, why? Because you're a Palestinian. These are just very small examples of the day-to-day -day, uh, life of, of, of Palestinians inside. On the outside, a lot of Palestinians are stateless. Lebanon, uh, uh, Jordan, Syria, and even in other places where they have a refugee card or an identity card that's called a refugee status card, you're stateless. You have no laws to protect you, apart from the United Nations. And we've seen how Unfortunately, useless the United Nations have been for uh, many years. So um, we're talking about uh, a nation or, or, or a people who internally are facing so many uh, hurdles and challenges, but at the same time, on the outside, they're also facing hurdles. They're, they're unable to, to, be, to be safe. They can't be safe. They're living either in refugee camps or they're not represented. And then another challenge is the in kind of you know internal, but not internal from a geographical point of view. We're talking about within oneself. How many Palestinians would still have hope after 74 years of occupation? And forget that. How many Palest how many Palestinians will have enough energy and enough uh, 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 what's the word motivation to carry on and persevere after all the waves of uprisings that have happened against the Israeli occupation? Hope is a big thing, and it's starting to fade. And that poses another challenge. Palestinians don't have clear leadership. There is not really uh, you know, a set uh, 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 leading uh, faction in, 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 in Palestinian politics at, at the moment. Unfortunately, there's a big dispute. Um, different factions are just fighting within each other. And therefore, they've lost sight of the future of the Palestinian uh, people. I think just to keep it there, just because that kind of...
I liked some of the changes. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Lafayette, for all your insightful answers. Um, we do have two questions that are more like discussion questions, so if it would be okay if you guys discuss it also between yourselves. The first question is, can there ever be a two-state solution? first thing about that question is it's a misleading question. To ask whether there's a possibility of a two-state solution presupposes that there was an option for a two-state solution. Israel from its very inception, and it's particularly post-1967, never wanted a two-state solution. So the two-state solution was never on the table. That's the first thing you have to understand. And for political students, you know, political science students, I think that's very, very important. How you frame a question is determined how you answer it. So question the question. Okay? Question the question. So I think, in, particularly in the media, in, in uh, sort of community dialogues and events like this, people will get asked if there, if there are two state solution possible. Somehow that assumes that there was a true state solution that was going to be possible. But Israel, as I mentioned, from the very beginning, as soon as it occupied it, it started transporting its own population depopulating the Palestinians, uh, and the ethnic cleansing continues. In, in fact, what we have, the Nakba did not stop in 1947-48. Palestinians leave the Nakba every day. And that what we saw recently in Sheikh Jarrah, in Gaza, and what's happening in West Bank now, is that continuation. So for me, the two-state solution was never on the table. Uh, what we have always had in an Islamic and Israeli ideology and uh, status quo where they want to have a three-tier system. One, where they have the Israelis themselves as elites living uh, with all the privileges and the rights that any people we would expect in the world to have. Then below that, they will create another system, another group of category, who will be given the citizenship of Israel, but will be second-class citizen and a third category called the occupied people. So you have a three-tier system, and that's why recently, in the last year particularly, we've had groups like Amnesty International, Bay Salem, uh, Human Rights Watch, even Special Rapporteur, all of them calling Israel to be practicing apartheid state, to be an apartheid state. And therefore, I think what we have to now think about and consider and reframe the question into how we try and bring Israel accountable to the system that it is exercising upon the Palestinian people. Uh, and I think what we then, the next stage is then to address that in a manner that is just first and foremost, that justice is in the center of that negotiation, and then bring about, hopefully, an end to the apartheid system and an end to occupation. And when I say end to occupation, I don't mean 67, I mean 47. Because simply something that was done in 47, 48 and not be forgiven just, be, just because it was 30 years earlier. That was a crime in international law, so was 67. So why is one crime forgiven over the other? They're both criminal acts and they cannot be forgiven. And therefore Israel has to be held accountable. It should be exposed for what it is. And I think we as students and particularly Palestinian activists should really not think and talk about a two-state solution because the two-state solution is not there. And I, I hope my two other speakers will expand why physically and politically and ideologically it's not there as well. Thank you. <coughs> uh, that was uh, very insightful. Uh, you know, just to add on to that, um, I would never have, I would never ever consider the two-state solution for one reason. You occupy my, and you steal my grandfather's land. You take my grandmother's home. You kill my family. You deny my existence and my right to breathe and to, to you know, self-identify as the Palestinian. To, to, you deny my right to self-determination and then you want me to split the land between you? That's ironic, like, no, buddy, I want my land. So no, it's not gonna work. Um, it, it, it defeats the purpose. And you, in, in, in the attempt for some people who claim that they can, determine their right to uh, self-determination, they deny my right to exist. 
and my right to breathe and my right to live. You know, at the end of the day, my, my family wouldn't have been here and I, I wouldn't have been in the United Kingdom and, you know, uh, my, my, my parents wouldn't have flown over and they wouldn't have migrated from different places if it weren't for the fact that someone decided to steal my grandfather's land. If it wasn't for the fact that someone kicked my grandmother out of her home. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for where I am now, but no one can come with this ironic approach to negotiate after putting me in that predicament in the first place. So no, no first, no, no, no excuses for me. I want to take you back prior to 1967. And I urge you to look at some of the, the historical records, the diaries of this rebel leadership at the time, people like Gambino, who said as early as 1959 that our aim is to take all of the land. And if you can go even back to the to the to the the Basel uh, uh, Declaration when the, when the Zionist movement was formed and they said our aim is to spew the, the Arabs across the, the borders. So the intent of, of, of seizing, of colonizing the, the, the entire territory was always there. It was always there. And it, it, the only thing that it, uh, perhaps many people both of it is the fact that it unfolded, you know, in, 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 in a peaceful, peaceful fashion. You see, it did not, it did not take place all of a sudden. In fact, after 1940, the Nigerians said they made a mistake. They made a mistake. They should have driven everyone out. Now, after the, at the time of partition, one eight one resolution, right wing activations. Fifty-six percent of the territory was given to the the, 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 the Jews, the Zionist movement, and the rest to the Palestinians. And even when when the state of Israel was created, they seized an additional fifteen percent, and they were allowed to keep this. Even Jerusalem, as a city, uh, at the time was declared an international city by the UN according to their resolution one eight one. And when they seized the western part of the city in 1948, the international community acquiesced to it. You see, they made, and now it's become a, a fait accompli. Everyone recognizes as if there's some kind of legitimacy to the Israeli presence in West, in, in West Jerusalem. When in fact, it, it, it was conquered. All the land of Palestine, in fact, has been conquered. Now, the, the Palestinian people did not have an, an umbrella, you know, very strong uh, leadership at the time, but they never accepted the partition of the land. And then by 1964, when the, the creation of the, the, the PLO and Fatah first, and then the umbrella body, the PLO, they, their original uh, objective was the total liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. That was the objective. There was no talk about two states at that time. All they wanted was the liberation of the land. But when they lost the war, by 1973, when the Arabs lost the war, the last big war came with Israel, when they lost, after that, they started to change. And the PLO, in fact, began to move towards an acceptance of the, the, the 1967 resolution 242, which called on Israel to vacate the, the territories they occupied in 1967 and, and allow the Palestinians to establish their state in that territory. So that's, what, that's the origin of the whole concept of a, of a two-state solution. Is it practical? And we've seen over the years, as we, we just heard from Dr. Patel, you know, the, there has been an incremental seizure of the land continually, you know, over the, the years. So even by 1993, when, when, when the Oslo Accords was, 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 was signed, uh, Israelis now had 78% of Palestine. And the, the so-called Palestinian state was supposed to be established on the remaining 22. Since, since then, you know, they have seized much more. And some estimates is that the Palestinians will only, if, they, if it were possible, 
to establish a state in the, in the remaining 22 percent in what is left sorry it would be something like eight percent of historic Palestine is this just of course it's not just so the, the, the thinking by the, uh, the official Arab leaders you see and the, and the so-called international community is that let's go for what is possible and not what is just so they're telling us now it is possible to have a Palestinian state in the, in the, in the West Bank on the remaining territory that Israel, the crumbs that Israel left for them. Let's forget about justice. But it is not possible. It is not possible simply because at, at present there are over, what, 220 settlements, Israeli settlements, scattered across the West Bank and Jerusalem. About 110 in Jerusalem and its environs, and the remaining in the West Bank. And they are joined by, by, by roads, bypass roads, and, and, and you have checkpoints, you see. So they have fragmented the territory in such a way that if a Palestinian wants to, wants to leave that this and, 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 and get to Bethlehem, he has to go through Israel. Okay, yes. just one uh, Sorry to cut you off, but uh, yes. 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 <laughs> yes. So physically, see, physically, it's not possible. You know, to have a state, you must, it must be territorially uh, 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 contiguous, and, and this is not the case in, in, in the West Bank. That's not. The case. <clears throat> sorry. Okay. The last discussion question is. How does the media portray the conflict and what impact does this have on both sides? So maybe try and have a more of a discussion. So how does the media portray the conflict? So this could be on the news, this could be on social media. Um, and what impact does this have on the Palestinian side and the Israeli side? I have to make a confession. I'll, I'll prepare for this question. <laughs> I'll make a hands free. You go. One of the things that is lacking in the media coverage on the conflict is, it, is the question of context. Context. You see, when you, when you report a subject, a, a tragedy, uh, you just don't say, well, uh, 52, 52 Palestinians were killed. Let's say, who killed them? <laughs> you know, or in, in retaliation. That's what the media gives us, the BBC and the mainstream. They don't tell us the, the background to the whole you know, tragedy. That there is occupation, that there are house demolitions, that there are extrajudicial killings. You see, that there is ethnic cleansing, the uprooting of people's olive trees. This is the context, that there is occupation, that there is seizure. So the media has to give us the context in order to understand what is happening. What they try to tell us is that well, this is a historic con uh, uh, conflict or dispute between two rival groups, two local communities fighting each other, and they have this historic enmity between them. This is not the, this is not the case. We have a colonizer and a colonized people. This is the reality. <laughs> and the media does not tell us this. They don't tell us that. You see, and they say that. The BBC says, we are impartial. But you cannot be impartial when there is injustice. You have to stand with the people who are wronged. You cannot, you, you see, if there is, if there is a, an oppressor and, and an oppressed people, you, you cannot remain impartial when there is oppression. You have to stand with the oppressed. So this whole notion that the BBC tries to tell us that they are impartial, it, it doesn't it doesn't make sense, you see. And one of their journalists, uh, he, 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 he tried he tried to develop this, this school of thought called uh, 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 compassionate journalism. You know that a journalist must be committed to truth. You know he must be committed to telling the truth rather than than anything else. And and this is what is sadly is lacking. In, in, in the coverage on, on the conflict. You see, the context uh, it has been skewed. 
presented in such a way that this is a, you know, a, a dispute between communities. Far from it. It is, it is not this. It's a question of a people who invaded the land, who conquered it, and who drove out its indigenous people, and they seek their land back. When they come to the question of resistance, they, dis they, they distort it, and they tell us this is terrorism. You know, uh, if you look at all the United Nations resolutions uh, during the period of, of decolonization in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia, all of these resolutions said that people who were colonized and who, who have been subjected to foreign domination are entitled to seek liberation and independence by all means, including armed struggle. In the case of Palestine, who, by the way, have not yet had independence, have not liberated their lands, and therefore they are entitled to struggle by all these means and the UN itself. You know? And this is why in 1994, when Madeleine Albright was the secretary, you know, the representative at the UN, she said that these resolutions are obsolete and irrelevant. Why? Because these are the resolutions which confirm the legitimacy of the struggle of the Palestinian people, something which the media will never accept and will always try to tell us, well, the Palestinians are innately a terrorist, a bloodthirsty you know, sort of people. Something that you know I think is is is, is obnoxious. It's, it's 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 contrary to reason and, and to the historical facts. I don't really have much to add. Okay. Okay. Uh, just on the question of this, you focused on the issue of the media. I think this is one of the most important questions. Thank you. Uh, because the media frames and educates people on thinking and expressing their sympathy and alliances uh, to the issue. So I think it's extremely important. And before I even start, I think it's extremely important we shouldn't simply talk about this, but respond to the media. So if you think of yourself as a Palestinian activist, then don't just retreat something that you're upset about, but actually get to the editors and write to them. And that is extremely important. And this is how in Britain the media operates, and this is some different stages that I've written about. The first thing they try to do is they prioritize Israeli sources. So whenever there is something happening on the ground, you will see more often than not that Israelis are represented who are professionals. Uh, they know what they're talking about, they know their history, they know how to frame it. And whenever the Palestinians are brought in, rarely they are, and sometimes they were, if they are ever brought in, it's either somebody from the street somebody who feels the trope of an individual who cannot express themselves, or who's emotionally angry, and cannot therefore come across as sympathetic, right? So that is the first thing. So how that framing is taking place is very important. The second thing they do is they try to muddy the water, right? And this is a very good example of this, is when Shirin Abu Akhla was assassinated. You immediately had an Israeli narrative in British media, then you had all this, complications that oh, it could have been, could have not been, uh, we need to have a test in it, basically stretched, oh, America's doing the investigation. So basically, you downplaying everything that is happening, the emotions have gone away, people forget about it, and then after six months, they say, oh, you know what, it was the Israelis. By then, you know, everything's forgotten, we've moved on to the next story. So these are tactics, these are not accidental. This is happening with a strategy, uh, and this is how the media is working. Then there's disinformation itself. So if you take, for example, April last Ramadan 2020, it was open for everybody to see that the Muslims were performing Salat in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Drones were used to drop, drop smoke bombs. People were shot at with rubber bullets. 59 people were injured. Despite that, and this is an amazing statistic that was taking place, so between 7th of May and 20, 20th of May 2020, on British media, just, this is just British media alone, 62,400 references were made to that attack, 62,400. Of those, the investigators have found that two-thirds, right, two-thirds, over 60%, referred to what happened in Masjid al as a clash. So you, you automatically see that despite the people who are praying being attacked at, it's, all, it's considered as a clash, means that you're, you're reframing the whole narrative. 
and this is what the media is doing. And therefore, words are extremely important. So words like clash from, the, 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 uh, from uh, conflicts, scuffle, es escalation of violence, a cycle of violence, all these things I think is something that we need to challenge. So the disinformation is extremely important in how the media is using that for us to work upon. And, and then you have Sheikh Jarrah itself. So for Sheikh Jarrah, what was considered is people were being evicted. As if, you know, they were illegal tenants. That, again, how that is framed. And we should then pick this up and start complaining. Uh, for example, uh, the headlines here on the 12th of May, there was a, uh, the Sun had a, had a title, 15 Kids Massacred. That's it. Right. Who are they? How are they Palestinian? You don't even know what's happening here. That's the title. Right. The BBC <coughs> then read a story that we say that the pe people are, are dying in Israel. Dying. Not being killed. I mean, you die of a disease, or you, know, you could die of so many different things, but you're not being killed. It's a different narrative. These kind of narratives are, are extremely important. The other thing now, from the journalist's perspective as well, there's intimidation. So journalists who try to put a story through, and in here I'll give you two examples. One was when the, the tower block in Gaza uh, with media outlet was bombed, the AP uh, Association Press Media outlet was bombed. The, a reporter from the SA categorically stated that there's no Hamas in this building and we were the main uh, occupants. They were fired. That editor was fired by the Associated Press. Similar thing happened in Germany last year, in particular the Arab press, and an accusation of anti Semitism came across. Luckily, that happened two years ago, then there was an internal investigation to find out whether the Germans were anti Semitic. The investigation found they were not anti Semitic, but they were not mainstream. So you have journalists itself, themselves being intimidated. That's why we as readers, consumers, need to support the journalists as well. So when you complain, you have to understand that it's a hierarchy within the uh, media outlet itself. So therefore it's extremely important for us to, to make sure that we, you know, we, we make sure that we put the pressure and change the narrative. For example, in British press even today, the word Palestine is prominent. You will not read Palestine. You read Palestinians, but not Palestine. Because Palestine equates a, a state. And they, can, they cannot allow the idea of a state to exist. Palestinians can exist because they can be occupied people, they can be refugees, it doesn't matter. But Palestine is a state. So these are the kind of demands we as activists should start making to the media. And this is some of the ways that the media is framing the story of Palestine and it's distorted. And that is why the majority of people in Britain remain ambivalent about the issue. Uh, and those who get to know about it become sympathetic. And that is what they're trying to stop. Because if the truth comes out, as Dr. Dao says, if the truth is mentioned by the media, you know, we'll have the majority of British people supporting us. Okay, experts have spoken, so I don't really have much to add. So. I want to encourage you to look at a book called Bad News from History, written by uh, Greg Filo from the Media Studies Institute at the University of Glasgow. Okay? Bad News from History. And then he wrote another one, a sequel, uh, called More Bad News from History. And one of the striking things that came out in this book was, he said he conducted a series of surveys, and he found that among his students, and the majority of students he found uh, uh, believed that the, that the Palestinians were the occupiers and the Israelis were the occupied people. How did this come about? How did this come about so that people would conclude that the Israelis are occupied and the Palestinians are the occupiers? Uh, he ascribed the, 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 the cause of this you know, misunderstanding uh, to the media coverage, it, 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 the skewed media coverage, you know, it, 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 in Britain and in the rest of the world generally. So, you know, before the example is given just now, you take for example the BBC always tell us that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. 
that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And, and, and this, and they, 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 they throw it at us every day, and you know, as there's a saying, lie until, keep lying until you be, people will believe you. And they tell lies that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And now people are, are beginning to accept this. They're not questioning the, the, the facts. How did they come to this conclusion? Thank you for all your insightful words. Um, now we're going to open it up to the floor. So if anybody has any questions, you can submit it to the slide over here, or you can put your hand up and we'll send you the microphone. Yeah. Sorry, I have loud I would like to, about the media, the mainstream media is like fading away, so, so, so social media is growing, so I would like to know uh, how, what the best way to approach someone like close-minded about the case, Palestinian case, uh, especially on social, social media, because all of us know the main, mainstream media, they are lying, so, if I, I know how to approach people, close-minded people, will be, we will know their context, they will teach them their context about the, what happening inside of Pakistan. So, uh, answer from all three of you, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Okay, I'll have to answer that first. Um, first of all, Put media aside for now, there, there's a huge educational base online. Um, and the fact people don't realize that. First of all, there's a website called palestineremix.com. Palestineremix.com is your best friend when it comes to documentaries, films, sort of drama films and documentaries, uh, split into either films or, or series in different parts and so on for educational purposes. So for example, there's a very, very insightful uh, uh, four-part documentary on a Nakba catastrophe. And it's on Palestine Remix and it's produced by Al Jazeera. Uh, similarly, you have uh, the Oslo Accords. And, and, and I think the name of the four part documentary is called The Price of Oslo, which talks about the entire roadmap to the Oslo Accords. So it's a huge database. It's got everything that's visual when it comes to uh, Palestine. Uh, I would definitely recommend. There's also uh, an online uh, free syllabus called uh, Macan, and they do workshops as well. So if you go on Macan Workshop, I don't know what the name of the website is. But it's a free, it's a free uh, platform online, you can sign up to it. Um, and YouTube, YouTube is, it's, it's got everything. The fact of the matter is, the Palestinian cause, pro-Palestine activists and Palestinians, history and truth is on their side. Academia, archives, everything shows that we're on the side of truth and we're on the side of justice. So if, if you, wherever you go, you will find evidence to prove it. You don't need uh, flashy videos and and uh, colorful news articles to convince people that we're on the right side. You just direct them to where the truth is written, and it's written either in uh, uh, academic papers or in documentaries and stuff, and, and it's very easy to digest as well. So, palestineremix.com, <coughs> Dan, um, yeah, and YouTube. <coughs> Fancy for that. Friends of Al-Aqsa. Oh, what the hell? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you know, give a shout out to Friends of Al-Aqsa because Actually, two, two outlets here, Friends of Al-Aqsa, who have been so active on the ground, grassroots, working to educate on so many levels, supporting students, supporting uh, uh, pro-Palestine activists of all, of all levels, uh, raising awareness, holding functions, holding workshops, holding events, and the same thing for the Middle East Monitor as well, because they've been raising awareness, they have um, very insightful videos, but they also hold functions, uh, uh, publishing books, uh, giving platforms to academics, and, and the work goes on. So Memo and uh, Friends of Aqsa are, are very, very important. Yeah. I just want to add one more thing about social media. I think what we should realize <coughs> is time social media is an echo. So you're talking to an echo chamber, and there's like-minded people, so you're not going across. So yes, social media is important, and you should always, the other thing about social media is you need to verify your facts. Uh, sometimes a lot of stuff is sent out that are either manipulated or you know, misleading. So those two things are, are sort of sort of danger marks. Therefore, at this stage, at the juncture in our life, uh, despite the fact that the mainstream, so-called mainstream media, is waning, 
we still need to engage with it. Uh, and I think we have to engage in it not, not simply because it has put an audience, but also we need to challenge the narratives of where it's been misrepresented. And in that way, we also become sharper ourselves in understanding our own position uh, and strengthening our knowledge base. So I think both are required. So we do need, do need to engage with social media, but remember it's short, short falls, if you like, uh, and also the mainstream. And also create your own sort of platforms as well. Well, I'm probably one of the oldest people here. And I think I need to just say one or two things quickly at the beginning. I've lived in Arab countries for about 40 years. I have a lot of Palestinian friends, I have friends from other Arab countries. And my aunt was a nurse in Jerusalem in 1945. So all the way through my family, we've had an identification with the people of Palestine. I'm no friend of Israel uh, in any way. But I think the most important question we don't ask ourselves is why is it not possible to find popular elected governments in areas which are, I know Morocco, for example, I know Egypt, Kuwait, and Jordan, and so on. And the Palestinians I know as individuals are highly intelligent, very civilized, and, and wonderful people. But what comes out of the situation in what used to be called Transjordan is that there's no dynamic leadership which is supported by the people there. <coughs> I've had friends from Gaza, I've had friends from Naples, Hebron. They don't seem to be able to act together to be able to make constructive suggestions about how the situation could be normalized with two groups of people living in close areas together. I deplore the way the Israeli Defense Force acts. I was, at some stage in my life, a colonial soldier, keeping people of various parts of the country peacefully not attacking each other. And I don't know how easy this solution could be. But what I do know is that people of the Arab fraternity have somehow got to learn amongst themselves how to act together in a way which makes constructive developments possible. I have friends in Morocco, we have a friend, intelligent student. They don't want to stay there. And it's a simple reason that they are not happy with the government under which they're <coughs> serving. You were making one, I thought, one of the very sensible suggestions, I may say, of how can one positively make suggestions for things which could be done to improve the possibility of working with the Israeli people who it's going to be difficult to get rid of them. I didn't support them coming there, but they're there. And uh, somehow it's got to be a thing which becomes a partnership. Uh, one of the Israeli chaps put musicians together on both sides. That's one sort of idea. I don't respect, personally, either of the leaders which the Palestinians have had in recent years. I think Mr. Abbas and Mr. Arafat were both, quite frankly, terrible leaders. And I think we as humans get the leaders we deserve. That should put us on the pigeon. 
try and answer that for you. Uh, unless you want to break it down. Just before you answer the question, is it okay if you just summarize? Your yeah, it's, the question is quite simple. The question is quite simple. The question is why is the Arabs not democratically representing the people? Uh, and, and the leadership of the people, basically. Not not the truth is, you know, the Western democracies have never supported the emergence of democratic elected governments across the Middle East. <laughs> they, they have never supported the emergence of democratic elected governments in the Middle East, whether it's in Egypt, or Tunisia, or Palestine. We've seen it in recent years. In 2006, there was an election, general election in Palestine, monitored by the United Nations and by the Carter Foundation from Atlanta, President Carter, and they confirmed that, it, that, that, that Hamas won the elections. What did the Americans do? They tried to overthrow the elected government. And I said, okay, we wouldn't, we wouldn't rule by ourselves. We form a government of national unity. They told Abbas, if you join hands with Hamas in a national government of, of unity, then we will not support you. So it, 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 we have to be truthful here and accept that, that Western democracies, America and Britain, because Mr. Blair played a part in this when he was the, the, the leader of the quartet in Palestine. It's well documented that they undermined the democratic process in Palestine. Look what happened to President Morsi in Egypt. Eh? Look what happened to President, he was elected by his people, but it was the West who, who supported, you see, his overthrow. And look at, look at Tunisia today. Look at Tunisia today. This, this, this man, he, he has usurped all powers unto himself. He, has claimed responsibility to write the constitution by himself. He dismissed the constitutional committee and said, I alone have the right to write the constitution. And President Macron went to visit him last week with that praise him and promised him help. So this is why we can't have democratic governments across the region, sadly. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I live in current countries. There has always been an enormous acknowledged acceptance of corruption. Now, I'm not saying that this country is marvelous. I don't agree with a lot of our governments, even the last six of them in the last two months. I don't, I'm not a friend of America necessarily at all. But until in my, my own feeling, and I'm a friend of the Arabs, most of my friends are Arabs. The problem is that they will not, I don't think, look at the mirror and accept what is wrong on their side of things. There's lots of things wrong with America, lots of things wrong with Britain. And uh, I wish that there would be some way, the elections in Gaza, it was in the Gaza was, It was in Palestine, across the occupied territories. Okay, let's not talk about Gaza. Let's talk about Hamas and Gaza. No, you were speaking about the elections. You were speaking about the elections. And I thought... Speaking about okay, I'm correcting you now. I'm saying that the elections were in all the territories, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, and in Gaza. And Hamas won, you see? And even after winning, they said, we, we would not rule by ourselves. We would form a, national, a government of national unity. The Americans said, if you form a government of national unity, Mahmoud Abbas, we will not help you. This is the end of it. The Israelis, they say, they say that the Israelis said, um, you don't represent us, Mahmoud Abbas, because you only represent your constituency. So when Mahmoud Abbas, you know, joins, with the opposition, with Hamas, they said we don't want to, rec we, don't, we wouldn't recognize a, a government that includes terrorists. It's, it's a, you know, you can't win. They do, you, they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. 
this is a problem. I think the, the, you know, the West has to give the people a chance to and not intervene and meddle in their internal affairs, you know, and, and use aid as a form of blackmail. If you don't do this, then you don't get aid. This is it in the Middle East. And sadly, many of these governments succumb to that, that threat. Look, I have been in Morocco during the elections. I have not seen to wait in other places where they've had elections. If anybody can tell me that an election in Gaza with Hamas there, as an example, everything is completely justified and there's no corruption and there's no pressure applied, we are seeing in Britain situations where elections are now becoming uh, less than honest uh, in the sense that uh, you can't always be sure that the person that's doing the paper belongs to a person that knows what they were voting about in certain households in certain parts of Lancashire, for example. And I can give you examples of that later on. I'm wary that you know other people want to ask questions, and I know it's going to, you, you want to input. But on this note, this is the same uh, rhetoric that is used to say you know uh, people shouldn't have followed the democratic route in Egypt. The same kind of rhetoric where we're saying, oh, we, we can't guarantee that there won't be corruption. But the whole point of democracy is to try, and no one was given a chance to try. So the, the fact is, if you're talking about oh, Mr., uh, uh, um, you know re removing corruption, removing uh, that toxin that's suppressing. The, the Arab world, the Muslim world, and, 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 and the rest of the world, really. Corruption happens everywhere, right? It's revolution. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, of course, because, because you know, just like Netflix changes the color grading on their videos and makes it seem like that we live in a sewer or in, in a dump somewhere. Similarly, the news does the same thing, where it shows as if corruption or, 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 or tyranny exists only in the Arab or Muslim world. The fact of the matter is, if it weren't for, and this is what Dr. Daoud said, if it weren't for the Western democracies that claim to be bastions of democracy and bastions of freedom and justice, them sponsoring the terrorism that exists in our land and them subjecting our people to the tyrannical regimes that they've put in, they've put these CIA approved regimes in to make sure that everybody is suppressed and that the oil is still pumping and the money is still coming, then this wouldn't have happened. So, what's the solution? Revolution, uprising. But unfortunately, right now, people are suppressed. Uh, I, I think I'll just take a chance for the last time. Let's have the next question. So we'll move on. Settlers be natives, and um, of course, you say them like no, they can't really. But um, like certain scholarly works, like Mahmoud Mandani or like Zurek, for example, they talk about decolonizing the politics in order to like then talk about natives and settlers. Um, just in terms of this, frankly, if I were to ask you, can natives be settlers in a more complex way? Like, just your thoughts on that. The natives can be settlers if they can commit genocide in ethnic cleansing. So, so settlers can become natives, excuse me, if they can commit genocide in ethnic cleansing. And we have seen that in the uh, USA, uh, in Australia, where they have committed genocide where the indigenous people have been wiped out. And the greatest human massacre in our history has been in USA where the indigenous, 36 million indigenous people have been killed. 36 million. Create the so-called United States of America. To create the United States of America. So yes, it can happen, but the narrative can never be permanent in the sense that it is always ongoing, and we live in history. You know, history is not something that happened in the past. Living is history in the present, because we frame in history what will become the future, and that is, I think, the decolonial uh, question in, in the sense that how do we then? use the language of the narrative first and foremost, and second, the resistance against the colonial movement, uh, or the settler movement. Uh, and that, that, that create, brings about a lot of 
problems and issues in the sense of how we're going to, in the present sort of power knowledge balance, how people like, especially in countries like Europe and Britain particularly, how do we then frame, particularly the issue of Palestine and the Palestinians? How do we refer to the Israeli occupants, uh, settlers? But I think we shouldn't give up, especially at this stage. And I think the, the point, the pivotal point has not been reached in which we can consider the Palestinians to have been wiped out or to have become irrelevant. So I think it's an ongoing process. And in fact, there was a, and you touched on something very practically very important. Recently, there was a group in Britain that came with a settler uh, and a Palestinian to almost legitimize the occupation and the settler movement, in which the settler rabbi was, and I paraphrase it, was saying things like, our identity and the Palestinian identity belong to the same land, therefore we should have the right to live in the same land. Without that land, uh, Jewishness has no meaning, neither has a Palestinian. Now you might, that might sound very provocative and settling, you might think, you know, this is something very uh, advanced and something welcome. But you soon realize what he's saying, that his legitimacy comes from the te religious text. He's claiming legitimacy to the land of Palestine based on the Bible. And we know, and the world accepts, that no religious text can be used for national identity. Muslims, if, if that was possible, then Muslims can say that our text says everything east and west belongs to us because we confess that our religion. You know, so we can say the whole world belongs to us. We can't say that. And we wouldn't want to say that. So we can't, if we do not allow that for ourselves, then we do not allow it for anybody else. So this idea of the settler trying to become the uh, dominant sort of narrative of the land has to be challenged and they come in different guises. And I think it can be possible, as I've shown you, but it doesn't have to be possible. Can I just to make a quick point here that you know the we have to go back to the origins of Zionism. That it is a Western movement, a Western colonial movement. It started in Europe Eastern Europe in response as a reaction to persecution of Jews in Europe and they went to Palestine. See, the, the, the separate. This is a movement that was rejected by the by the orthodoxy, by the Jewish orthodoxy in Europe. The the, the rabbinic rabbinate rabbinate in Germany, they rejected it. They said this has nothing this is contrary to our beliefs as Jewish people. See? These people were not, were not religious people. They were secularists. They had no you know, adherence to, affinity to the Jewish faith. And so, you know, the, the Eastern Jews, the Israeli and the Sephardis, as we, we, some call them, they are discriminated against today. You know? In order to, to move up the social ladder, they have to go to the army and become what you know, um, extremists, you know, in, and, 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 and brutalize the Palestinian people. That's how they move up. But the, the, the truth is, they are, are, are discriminated against, you know, in, in, in a very inhuman manner, and it is not spoken about. Sorry, Mira. It's okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, my name is Dr. Abir Faraon. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm also the uh, proud mother of Bushra, your host today. Um, I want to bring the heart perspective to the discussion. Um, my family um, were forced out of our home in Jerusalem uh, in 1967. Um, my family suffered all kinds of suffering migrating to Jordan where I lived, I was born there, and I lived until I came to the UK to study my master's and PhD here, and then we have Bushra and uh, her brothers, brother and sister. Um, it's very hard to live away from your home country. It's very hard. When I got the British passport, and that's how I was able to visit 
my home country because I was unable to visit Palestine without that. Um, in the summer, I went to Jerusalem and I cried. I went back to my family home and it just feels so, so difficult to find someone else living in your own house, in your own garden, planting trees that you have planted at some, some point of time. It's very difficult to find that your dwellings, your neighborhood, every, everything that you once owned and you once lived in peace, it's been taken away from you. Um, we are now in 2022 and we all know the war in Ukraine. Russia is an invader. If, fast forward, God forbid, and all kinds of, hopefully that doesn't happen, if Russia stayed in Ukraine, and we fast forward 70 years or 80 years ahead, and the new generations arrive, will they think of the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a colonization? or as new people living in that country. If the, if the Russians, God forbid again, were to, obviously they, they, they damage the country, but if they were to take homes and they will live there and they will start to have more children, and how will the new generations in the UK or any other country, how will they look at that? Will they look equally to what's happening now in Palestine, to our homes, to our families, to our farms? That, has been, that have been taken in Palestine with the same equal eye or not. I want to tell you about how the, the, the suffering of the refugee camps that are still until this moment of time, that are in Lebanon, that are in Jordan, that are in Syria, that the suffering of the Palestinian people that are until this moment of time do not own a toilet in their own homes and they share toilets with someone else outside their houses. Until now, they do not have fresh water. Until now, they do not have the right to have uh, education for their children and that's why they are migrating to other countries. I want to tell you about the suffering of my relative who in 1967, when she was trying to pass the Jordan River in order to leave Palestine and go to uh, to Jordan, she was in her, she was in labor. She gave birth just before crossing the Jordan River. Can you imagine that? And she was forced to cross the Jordan River in labor. We have suffered a lot in Palestine. We suffered a lot outside of Palestine. The suffering on the humanitarian side, on, on the people's lives, it's not recorded anywhere. We are talking politics, we are talking about the media, we are talking about this and that. But the suffering, they are human beings. The suffering, if you are unable to take your child to, to, to a doctor in Gaza, for example, or take your child to, to be operated because of the siege. That's what's happening in Palestine. On a daily basis, we are suffering. The other day, they killed two brothers. Can you imagine the feeling of the mother? who raised these two, two brothers. One has graduated only last year and one is just about to graduate. They killed one of them and when he rushed to help his brother, they killed the second one. She had three children. Now she has one daughter. Both of them passed away. Why? Because of injustice. Because we, are, we do not have the right to speak out. We do not have the right to say this is our land that we lived, as Brother Dawood said, since the Canaanites arrived, they were Arabs. We have the right to live in our land. They came and occupied our land. If we live until forever, it will stay our land and we will liberate our land. We will one day, and that's by the hadiths of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu that it will be liberated and we will have our land back. I want to motivate you, this is gonna happen. Just believe in it. As I see you, it is going to happen. And it will happen, inshallah. And that's why you, the generations, you need to do something for Palestine. Do not just sit and just watch. You need to act as soon as possible. Speak to your friends. Speak to, to uh, mobilize. Join the Palestine Society. Do anything that you can. Educate yourself about this. 
and do something, please. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any more questions? So, thank you for the word. I, I think everyone likes me. I think everyone speaks like the, like the truth and everything is far out. I think we get, our problem, we, we don't know how to make our voice louder or because we don't uh, own the media, so we own the social, if, if we can do better on social media, I think the, the, the big problem is it's nobody hear the stories, the, the, the sad and beautiful stories. So the, the Zionists like on the media. So if if some somehow or the, you know better than us, like guide us how to make better advertise about the Palestine um, case. So we know how to start like movement against the traditional media, I think we, we can do better. So we have good stories and sad stories and everything, but no, if nobody hear you, nobody know what happening. So just, I, I want to know how, if someone close-minded like cannot hear you, how to start like the question, how to start the doubt in his mind so he, he can do. So, the first, I want to know how to approach someone close-minded. He don't believe nothing about Palestine. So if you guide, like, you, you, you guide us, we will start. Like I know people everywhere, everyone here will start to do something about the case. And thank you. Uh, one, one of the things I can touch on the media's tactic is exclusion. Uh, the media will not allow your voice to be heard. And, and that is actually not just the media, in fact, most of you have uh, Asian uh, and non white background. So you will find that in most of your institutes as well, is that the exclusion really hurts when you do not become part and parcel of where you, your voice is heard. So you're not the expert, you're not the professional, you're not the, the good person, right? And that needs to change. And in a way, it is changing. And it's changing in two ways. One, within the traditional uh, institutes, including the media itself, those are being knocked. More of all people are entering, and more people are being questioned about how they're presenting the issue of Palestine and generally of, of, of the marginalized. But also, the second thing that's happening is we have now our own media. When you say we, uh, I don't mean personally we, but those with decolonial mind, those who want to have their narrative to be heard. So I'm thinking of papers like Ibn al Memo, Middle East Eye, Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera. These things are emerging and we have access now. And don't believe for a second that what we hear in Britain is what the world hears. And I'll give you an example, and I know for certain that, let me give you an example of the World Cup. When England played Wales, we in Britain thought everybody in the world was watching that game and everybody in the world was thinking about what's going to happen to the England and Wales. My cousins were in Germany, and in Germany they didn't show that game. They showed the alternative game. I forgot what it was, but they didn't show that game. What I'm trying to tell you is, just because we're in this country, don't navel gaze and think that the whole world is also thinking what we're thinking. The world outside is much bigger. And the consequences of that, the navel gazing, is also very important in how then, both in academia and how narratives are presented. And again, I give you an example of last year, that when the Taliban, you might think this is obscure, but listen to this carefully. When the Taliban, all of a sudden, within a week, took over Kabul, a miraculous turnaround of victory. That's how it was presented. Look at the papers. Somehow, 
this country that was being controlled by Europe and Americans, over a week or two weeks, Taliban were over to take over the country. That was far from the truth. The truth was the Taliban was working all its way for the past 10 years. And America was on the losing side, but we never heard that losing side. Therefore, it became a miracle. Right? So there's a change of narratives. And that's why sometimes you have so-called instant revolution. They're not instant. No, they're brewing there. It's just that we don't hear the narratives. What happened to the Arab Spring? Right? To us, they were given as an instantaneous moment. One person did this, and all of a sudden, the whole country. No. There was decades of oppression supported by Eurocentric powers. That oppression was never shown to us. They were not we ever told. And therefore, we wake up thinking, yes, this was something that happened overnight. It's not like that. It takes years and lives of investment, hours of toil, world movement. South Africa, you know, Nelson Mandela didn't just one day come out of prison just like that. There were demonstrations around the world. Margaret Thatcher, just a week before he was going to come out, maybe a month before he was going to come out, called him a terrorist. You will never be allowed in this country. She said, and then she had to roll out the red carpet for him. He is more famous than she is in the world. Right. Again, it's a movement. So let's don't focus on what's happening here and think there are people out there with closed minds. You know, big, the world is much bigger. Don't be Eurocentric in your views and perspective. Sometimes we think we're decolonial, but we look at Europe and think, wow, this is it. It's not. Let's, let's diverge, right? And then tap into that world. Look at, the, look at this Qatari World Cup. Even British fans, right, are shouting free Palestine. I think it's, most of you must have seen this Israeli news uh, television channel interviewing British uh, fans saying, is the cup coming home? And they all shouted, yes, and free Palestine. And then they had to cut it. In fact, they then they put a sanction to say this has a copyright if anybody that promotes it will be sued. Right. So you can see that the world is different. So yes, these things are happening, but not in a global sense. So let's think, we are global. And this is what frightens the Eurocentrics, that what we are doing is transcending the nationhood structures. We, the Ummah, we, the Palestinian supporters, we, the decolonials, we, the marginalized, are transcending the global structures. And that threatens them. And therefore, let's look at something bigger. So yes, we have problems. We have to go and go above it and work harder. That doesn't mean we have to be complacent. But we're not on the losing side. Thank you, Jazak. Also, just one thing I wanted to ask about, which was why are we concentrating on the closed minded people? They're not actually a very big proportion. The people who are most likely going to be completely closed off are the Zionist people who are like, it's their side of the debate, if that makes sense. But the people who are confused on it, and the people that are, don't know, those are the people that are easier to kind of, when you talk to them about the historical facts. The people who are close-minded are the people who are not, not just ignorant, but they're the people who have been brainwashed by the Israeli side of things. That's the, the people who are usually close-minded. But I know you want to continue the discussion, but I'm just... It's being used. It's being used. We have we have activists everywhere. And they're using social media. I, I don't know why you're not seeing social media being used. So, for example, America. Let's let's look America. Is it okay if we just continue? Can we just continue the rest of the questions and then we'll go back to it if we have time at the end? Um, okay. So we have a few more questions. That on the slide of it wasn't doing that. Well, the first question we had is, what is the most viable roadmap for peace and some determination in Palestine with the normalization becoming so popular recently? Uh, I'll take that. <laughs> What's the most viable roadmap? We do not know. The thing is the struggle has to carry on. And the second part of that really doesn't mean anything. Yeah, the normalization of the countries with Israel is just simply showing that the force from the Eurocentric powers in the USA and Britain on the, the dictators.
leaders of the region who continue to be dictatorship, they have to make alliances with Israel. In fact, this is a sign of weakness, not strength, for me. The reason these countries have to make a normalization process with Israel against the will of their people, as we have seen recently, and we can all be confident enough saying that all those countries who normalize the relationship with, their, with Israel, their people are against it. So in a way, that is nothing popular. It's not popular, but it is a desperate sign of the world order trying to normalize Israel's occupation of the Palestinian people. As far as the viable roadmap is concerned, I think it very much depends on the Palestinian public and people and, and people who are within the region. And we, we, what we have to do is we have to expose the Israeli excesses, the discrimination, the violations of laws, the suffering of the human beings. We have to give the sufferings of the Palestinians a face. We should not avoid giving numbers, try to give names, try and remember who's suffering, and that humanize the suffering of the Palestinians. And I think that is one way of doing this. One of the things we have to focus upon is the emergence of an apartheid state in Palestine. An apartheid state which Reverend Desmond Tutu said is worse than what they experience in South Africa. Brother Ismail knows what happened in South Africa. It was totally inhuman. In fact, apartheid has been, there is a treaty in 1976 which would said that apartheid is a crime against humanity. And this is what exists in Palestine today. So what we have to do, we have to work hard to dismantle this, this inhuman system through boycotting Israelis and their systems, you know, the, the educational systems, the cultural systems, the politicians, the economic structures, everything has to be boycotted. As it was, they have to be isolated and become a pariah state, as South Africa was a pariah state in the 1980s. That's the way forward, see? And the whole question of Zionism, Palestine has to be de-Zionized. There must be no room for Zionism. There was a time when Zionism was declared a racist ideology by the United Nations, by international consensus. It was declared a racist ideology. And it only changed, it, only, it was only taken off the books when the power structures changed, when the United States became the, 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 the sole global power after the Soviet Union was, 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 was dismantled in, in 1990. That's when Zionism was taken off the books, you know, as a racist ideology. We have to resurrect this, this notion that this, this philosophy, this way of thinking, this colonial project, you see, is, is, is anathema to human development and to justice. Well, on this note, um, on the idea of power and, 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 and the changes of power and stuff, a couple of things. On, on the idea of normalization, normalization is a very, again, it's a normal thing. It happens throughout history. Um, during, during the time of the Mongol Empire, when they, when they came in and they, uh, they occupied Baghdad and they, and they just carried on. They swarmed all the way towards uh, uh, Jerusalem. Uh, there were Muslim leaders who had their own dominions, who uh, ruled entire states, who were normalizing relations with them. And they were going into peace treaties with them at the expense of other people. So the idea of normalization is not new. We, what we need to do is put that on the side and remember that it's repetitive. History repeats itself and focus on the target. The target is seeking justice no matter uh, what the cost is. But the minute we tie ourselves and we say, oh, you know, I don't know, uh, the UAE or Saudi Arabia or someone else is normalizing ties with Israel, it doesn't stop us and it doesn't hinder us from carrying on. That's just, we, we, we carry on. We remember by educating ourselves of, uh, uh, of the history of the trials and, 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 the, and the hurdles that people before us have gone through. Palestine, for the Palestinian issue is not one of the first issues. It's not the first humanitarian crisis. Just like Israel, just like apartheid in South Africa existed, just like uh, uh, um, occupation in India happened, and just like so many other colonial entities existed and took advantage of, of indigenous lands, it, it repeats itself. So we just need to remind ourselves of the of the central uh, value, and that's justice and seeking justice. It repeats itself, and we don't have to worry too much about the idea of others normalizing. That's very good.
Um, the second question we received is thoughts on the film Tarha uh, that recently has been streamed on Netflix. I personally haven't watched it, but so I don't know what everyone's thoughts. Sorry. And I think you guys should watch it and then open it. I haven't watched it, but I've got two. I mean, we've been talking about it quite a lot to our network. And two points on that is the reaction of the Israelis shows how fragile they are. That simply a film can make them react so violently. Calling for censorship and banning, uh, so called freedom uh, of speech uh, on one side, and forgetting boycotting, that boycotting is really evil thing, no one should be boycotting, but they want to boycott far and they want to make sure that you know, freedom of speech is not allowed. But that, the background of that is very important. I think we should remember that Israel is a very fragile state and it, it is always trying to hide what it's doing. And this film is exposing that. So I think that's a very important point. And the second factor is here in Britain and culturally, Palestinian issue is entering the cultural norm. It's going away from uh, what your sister Bill said, from the politics uh, into culture. And that transition is important. And if you study resistance movement, in particular in South Africa, uh, you will notice that there was a point in time when the apartheid system in South Africa changed from political to cultural. When ordinary people started aligning with it, they don't care about politics, they just know the humanity. They just simply know this is wrong, and they start talking about it. And that is what Farah is doing. Farah is culturalizing the population to say it is, this is wrong. They don't want to know the politics, they just want to know the humanity of it. So those two factors, the exposure of Israel as a fragile state through the film and also the culturalization of the Palestinian movement are kind of significant factors that expose the film exposure. Uh, just to quickly add on that, um, if something pisses off the Israeli government, maybe they're doing something right. Um, the other thing, I, I, so I, I, funny enough, I watched it on the way to Manchester today. Um, and as a, uh, the fact that it's caused this, you know, um, controversy and this outrage from Zionists and, and, uh, and the Israeli government, it's a good thing. But if, if, if to be fair, um, in terms of the Palestinian story that it, it, it projects, uh, it doesn't say enough. Um, it's nowhere near enough because what happened during the Nakba cannot be uh, centered around. I, I don't want to. Burn, I don't want to ruin the movie for you guys to be honest. But can I? Anyways, basically, it takes a portion and it, it isolates from the, the rest of the events. So really and truly, I think a movie to be more effective just needs to include everything that's happened, even if it's in a day's scope, but it should just include more of what happened during the Nakba. Uh, uh, but this is because I think the expectation, again, Jordanian directors or producers or Arab producers, they probably expected that those who were going to watch it would know something. But really and truly, this goes back to educating the world and educating the masses. You need to assume someone doesn't know anything. And to do that, you need to set more historical understanding and give more uh, information. There's a novel that I would always recommend, and it's called Morning to Jillian. Uh, and if you don't shed a tear reading it, then I question your vanity. Um, it's an incredible novel. It's called Morning to Jillian. If I had millions or billions, I'd fund a movie for it because it's amazing. Also, there's a four-part drama. Um, this, this was released maybe in 2010, 2009 by Channel 4, and it's got very mainstream actors. It's got the actress from The Crown, if anyone's watched The Crown, uh, season one and two, who, Claire Foy, who acts as the queen. Uh, she's actually the, the main character in The Promise. It's a four part by Channel 4, definitely watch it. These, are, these show the story even more, and they connect it actually back to Britain. So it's very nice, so. Uh, uh, So basic, and um, to just end it off about the film, it's really important, uh, you know, like, in general, it's a positive feedback for the film, so it's really important for everyone to rate it positively on IMDb, because, well, we don't want it, the uh, Zionists to rate it down. Uh, so again, that's something. Um, the third question we received was, does the British government get enough scrutiny for the plight of the, Palest for the, uh, of the Palestinians given the historical Simple answer, no. <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, and they should, they should take them to task a lot more than they've been taken for. Because I think the Palestinian crisis has been facilitated right from the beginning by the British government. Uh, the very fact that uh, 
Basel Declaration is based on anti-Semitism. Uh, it wasn't based on anything else, not wanting Jews from Europe to come to Britain, wanting them to be exported, uh, and then helping Zionist, two Zionist, Erdogan and Stendhal, brigades during the Second World War, uh, and arming them, and then abandoning the whole issue to the United Nations. I think Britain has a major role to play. And even up, up until today, the fact that they're selling arms to Israel, which we should campaign for, at least the minimum they should do, the British government should sell arms, and something we should all take on board. Uh, so I think, yes, there's a lot more that we can do. Well, I think I am certainly in agreement with uh, Dr. Patel on this. Um, at the very least, Britain has refused for several years to offer an apology for its responsibility for the Palestinian tragedy. Not even an apology. So it's an indication of how far we, we have to go on, on this. Uh, but I want to just trigger your minds and to take you back to a scenario 2019 or 2015 when Jeremy Corbyn became the leader of the, the Labour Party. Was it really because of anti-Semitism that we had this undeclared this war against Jeremy Corbyn? There is a view, a school of thought, that many people in the British establishment would fear that Jeremy Corbyn was going to end up in, in number 10 Downing Street. And what would be the implications for Palestine? We would probably would have had a government that would would reverse policies on Palestine, you see. The blanket of blank support that is given to Israel would have been revoked, you know, and a recognition of the Palestinian state in the West Bank, whatever is left there. So I, I think we, we, we close, we, we're, not, we're not too far off, you know, from a scenario where things will change. We just have to keep going, you know, keep, keep pressuring, keep asking questions, demanding, from them, you know, at least an apology first, withdrawal of support, you know, the, 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 the technological cooperation between Israel, Britain and, and Israel, transfer of, of computer chips to fly these drones and, and helicopters to kill people in Gaza. All of that comes from Britain. And we've seen, you know, activists, you know, targeting the, the factories that made these equipment, you know, they should be supported. They should be supported. If you can't support them physically, support them morally. But I, I think, yes, more has to be done you know, to hold the British government accountable for its crime in Palestine. Certainly. Our next question is, realistically speaking, how would Palestine be free? Uh, it's the sad reality of the world we live in that Whoever is in power will do as they please, regardless of the public opinion. I was just going to say, let's wrap up the event, and if anybody wants to stick in um, to ask any more questions, the other two speakers will be here for. Um, All right, show for to me, boys. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes appears, especially in the face of power and so much uh, suffering and misery in the past years, that power will always succeed. But that is not always true. You know, yes, power does cause a lot of harm, uh, but it cannot always succeed against the people. And uh, again, sorry to labor, you keep on mentioning South Africa. But South Africa was a nuclear power. It was one of the most powerful states, not only in Africa, but in the world at the time. But when the people went against it, they couldn't handle it. And if you look at most of the leaders around the world as well, uh, even Afghanistan we mentioned, they were not very powerful. They were against the most powerful state, uh, United States of America. America in Afghanistan was the same thing. Or USSR in Afghanistan was the same thing. Or now look at USSR against uh, uh, Ukraine. So you, power itself, yes, causes a lot of misery, and we feel in the face of power that we cannot do anything. But human resistance and collective human resistance, that's more important, collectiveness, I think can bring about a change. So I think we shouldn't become despondent. And in 
fact, we should be able to hold power to account. And I think that is what we need to learn to do. How we effectively do that, where we cause the least amount of casualties and harm to the people who are living under that power, is I think is even very important. Uh, but we have to carry on. Um, and a big thank you to all three of our speakers for attending. Um, <laughs> and I really thought, yeah, yeah. Um, um, also, I'd like to just quickly say that our sponsors for this event is ASAP. Um, and this is a student-led organisation that basically just looks after and guides and supports all the PASOCs around the United Kingdom. Um, and our ASAP ambassador is in the back there, um, and inshallah they're basically just here to help um, Palestinian society, so Zakat al for them, and Zakat al for our wonderful audience and your amazing questions. Um, if you do not follow us on Instagram, then please follow us at Yoram Center Palestine, um, and I'll see you all in the next event, inshallah. Did you guys hear me? Thank you.